Thank you to the Library of Congress for hosting this wonderful event and for you guys for joining us and being interested in animal emotions and human-animal relationships. My name is Dr. Betsy Horelko. I'm the Animal Welfare and Research Manager at the Smithsonian's National Zoo, which means I have the honor of working with animals on their psychological well-being. It is a lifestyle concept, and it's very similar to the wellness concept that we hear about all over marketing every kind of channel for optimal life for humans. But for animals, we're making it very different and unique by species and also per individual. So there's a lot of topics that we're gonna hear today that make this very near and dear to my heart. Another reason why I'm very excited about it is because these two authors have played a role in my own development as a scientist. So I've followed Franz's work for years. A lot of his own research has formed the basis of inspiration for my own work. And I had a chance to take a class, my very first comparative cognition class with Alexander Horowitz in grad school, which was um, a number of years ago. <laughs> we'll kind of leave it there. So please allow me to introduce these wonderful authors for you. Let's see. Dr. Franz Duval is a biologist and primatologist known for his work on the behavior and social intelligence of primates. His first book, Chimpanzee Politics, compared the schmoozing and scheming of chimpanzees involved in power struggles with that of human politicians. <laughs> Just gonna let you enjoy that, sink that in. <laughs> Ever since, that was 1982, so please make sure to read it again and again because it has been re-released and plays a huge role in everything that we do. Ever since, Franz has drawn parallels between humans and primate behavior from peacemaking and morality to culture. His scientific work has been published in hundreds of technical articles, and his popular books have been translated into 20 languages. They've made him one of the, most, the world's most visible primatologists, something to aspire to. Franz is the C.H. Candler Professor of Psychology at Emory University. He's a director of the Living Link Center at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. He's a distinguished professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He has been elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. He was selected by Time as one of the world's 100 most influential people today, and by Discover as among 47 all-time great minds of science. You want me to start? No, no, no. His latest research concerns empathy and cooperation, inequity aversion, and social cognition in chimpanzees, bonobos, and other species. We're gonna have a moment for our speakers to introduce the book concepts to you themselves, but just to make sure you're aware of who this wonderful person is on my left, I'm gonna tell you about her before we have a chance for Franz to speak. Also, Franz is here, of course, to speak about his book, Mama's Last Hug, Animal Emotions and What They Tell Us About Ourselves. So Dr. Alexander Horowitz is keen on the mind of the dog. She has long been interested in understanding the umwelt of other animals, and her research and writing is aimed to answer the question of what it's like to be a dog. What is their experience? She's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Inside a Dog, What Dogs See, Smell, and Know, among other books. She's also written about the joys of paying attention to the ordinary, the pleasures of footnotes, which are very funny in this book, um, the veracity of animal characters in children's books, working dogs, and show dogs. She's a professor at Barnard College at Columbia University, where she teaches seminars in canine cognition, creative nonfiction writing, and audio storytelling. As a senior research fellow, she heads the Dog Cognition Lab at Barnard, and at home she lives with two dogs, a cat, and two humans. <laughs> she is here to speak about her latest book, Our Dogs, Ourselves, The Story of a Singular Bond. <laughs> So we, before we delve into this conversation, the author's gonna have a chance to speak to you to tell the, you a little bit from their perspective about their books. And later on, as we wind down the discussion, as our stage manager had mentioned, we're gonna invite you to ask questions. So keep that in mind as thoughts pop into your head throughout the next 40 or so minutes. So Franz, if you would start us out, please tell us about Mama's Last Hug. Thank you. Let me see, do it, yeah. I don't need this, I go, I guess. Well, thank you, and um, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, I, yeah, I wrote Chimpanzee Politics. I feel we live in the time of Chimpanzee Politics <laughs> at the moment. 
but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm not, not going to say anything about that. So I wrote a book about emotions, and, and it's a sort of odd that a book like that is necessary. Um, it's maybe not necessary for the average dog owner or cat owner, I don't know, but uh, in science, we have been reluctant talking about emotions, and, and that's why I felt a book like this was needed. So we, we always start with the face, with the human research on emotions, we started with the face, with the animal emotions, we started with the face. And of course, the facial expressions are very similar between us and the other primates. And there was a time, oddly enough, where the textbooks all said that clearly humans had many more shades of emotions than animals. We, we had all these subtle emotions, and uh, as a result, we have many more muscles in the face than any other animal. Uh, to express all these emotions. And, and recently, like five years ago, they, people analyzed for the first time the facial uh, post-mortem in chimpanzees, the facial musculature, and they found exactly the same number of muscles in the chimpanzee as in the human. And so all the subtle emotions that we express can be expressed by uh, a chimpanzee. Now, it all started with Darwin. In his days, you could freely talk about animal emotions. And so Darwin wrote a whole book about animal emotions, a very uh, important book, The Expression of the Emotions, also focused on the face. And it's the only book of Darwin that disappeared. Darwin had, I think, seven or eight books. It's the only book that disappeared for a whole century, was not printed, was not seen, um, because uh, people didn't want to hear about animal emotions, because we had Skinner and the behaviorists who basically told us that we shouldn't talk about emotions, not emotions, not cognition, not intelligence. I don't know what animals had, but they had none of these things. They were basically machines at the time. Now, I worked with a professor, Jan van Hoof, and I will show him also at the end of this talk. Uh, Jan van Hoof was a specialist in the expressions of emotions in, in primates. And so I'm very used, from the beginning, I was very used with all that work. And one of the things that Jan did was make a distinction between the smile and the laugh, and to show that the smile and the laugh come from different expressions in the primates. We, we tend to glue them together and say it's a sort of the same expression, but the smile comes from the Beatrice face, which is a nervous, sometimes submissive expression, and also in humans, people who smile too, enough, too much, we sometimes call them nervous. And um, the laugh has a sound, and the laugh has an open mouth display, and I'm, I'm actually gonna show you a little bit of an example. This is. Uh, this is a bonobo who has been playing with my postdoc, Zana Clay, and they both have the same sort of expression. This is the laugh expression here of the primates. And it's very similar, and the sounds are very similar also to our laugh. Uh, I'm going to play this little video, and I, ho I hope there's going to be sounds with it, because this is a um, sanctuary worker who is tickling some chimps. Yeah, so a young chimp has the same tickling spots as uh, children under the armpits, in the belly, and so on, and they have the same reaction. They push their hands away, and then when you take them away, they want them to come back. And they, uh, <laughs> so they have the same ambivalence about tickling and laughter. So we do a lot of studies on empathy. It's, it's actually my main topic of research. Uh, in the book, it's only one chapter. Uh, we do a lot of work on consolation behavior. I'm just actually back myself from Lola, where we do the bonobo studies. Uh, a week ago, I was there in Kinshasa, where we do the work. And I'll, I'm going to show you two consolations, which is an expression of empathy. That's also how em empathy in young children, in human children, is often measured. Uh, what you see here is a, a young bonobo, like a three-year-old bonobo, who gets bitten by a female. That's not what we do with children, but um, it's... Um, it's the same sort of situation. Gets bitten by a female, screams, and you will see what happens. Brandon, you just uh, attacked Mila. I'll show you another one. This is a, a, a juvenile, a bit older, who screams. Mm -hmm. 
So we do, we do this work on, on empathy expressions in, in a variety of primates, and just actually uh, talking about dogs, uh, when Alex, Alexandra talks about the dogs, the dogs, dog studies have been done also now, where you have a family member in a human family who cries, and then you see how the dogs respond, and the dogs show consolation responses also. So the, the empathy we nowadays assume, because there's a lot of rodent work, like rat and mice now also on empathy, empathy is present in all the mammals. There's, there's no exceptions to it, basically. So we do, do the kind of work in elephants also. So the last thing I want to say is uh, Mama's Last Hug. The, the book is named after Mama, the chimpanzee, an alpha female chimpanzee in chimpanzees. And um, she was an extremely influential and diplomatic character in that colony. She was not dominant over the males. Physically, female chimpanzees never dominant over the males. But she was uh, more powerful, I think, than most of the males in the sense that she and the oldest male of the colony, they both decided basically everything. And uh, she was such an important character. For 40 years, she lived in that colony and she ran it basically. Uh, and then she, she, um, her, her health deteriorated and at the age of 59, she died. And um, my professor, Jan van Hoof, who also had known her for 40 years uh, and, and just like me, had a very close relationship with her, uh, he went into her night cage, which normally we would never do. Um, we, you never go in with an adult chimpanzee. An adult chimpanzee is much stronger than you are, so that, that's a very risky business. And so we had never done that. And he entered her uh, cage basically to say goodbye because she was dying. And she was rolled up there in her nest. Um, and th the interesting thing of this encounter, I'll play it for you is that I think Mama must have sensed that Jan was very nervous about entering. And, and instead of him reassuring her, it ended up her being reassuring him. So you will see how that goes. So he enters, and at first she doesn't see him, and then she notices him. So this gesture is a gesture that a, a female chimp will make to a, a child who is distressed and calm them down. Basically, that's what she's doing with him. And uh, when it, this was played on, on Dutch TV, um, on national TV, uh, there were many reactions, and many people were very moved by it, which I could fully understand. But there were also many people very surprised by it. They were very surprised about whom, how human like the expression, how human like the gestures were. And that's why I took that as the title of the book, because uh, we all know that chimpanzees are our closest relatives. So why would you be surprised that their expressions are very similar to ours? I mean, that's a completely logical. Everything that we do, you can see in chimpanzees and, and the opposite. I don't think there's uniquely human emotions. I think all the emotions we have, we share with other species. And uh, this was an illustration of it, and that's why I took that as the title of the book. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Franz. I'm sorry we didn't provide tissues. Um, actually, this book I carried around for a couple of weeks and a whole trip to Kenya with, my, with my, all of my things because I wasn't quite ready to read it. But it is, it is so much more than just this story. Um, so I, I do hope you have a read. If we can talk a little bit about dogs. Alexandra, can you tell us a little bit about our dogs? Sure. As I Ooh, I our, <laughs> cool off. Take it to you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Betsy. Uh, thanks to the Library of Congress, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'm sorry I don't have dogs here with me on the stage, because that is the great disappointment that I bring to almost every presentation. But I find dogs don't really appreciate me talking, particularly. <laughs> So it's all right if you left them at home. I am a researcher of dog cognition and behavior. As Betsy said, I have a dog cognition lab at Barnard College, and I'm very interested in finding out essentially what it's like to be another creature. And my 
creature of interest is the dog. So what it is like to be a dog, and my previous books are on those topics. Inside of a Dog was about all the fairly recent research in dog cognition, which gives us some insight into what they know and understand, which is sometimes uh, not what our intuitions say and sometimes bear out our intuitions. And then I wrote a book, uh, Being a Dog, which was more about what it's like to live in a world of smell because as we know, dogs are olfactory creatures. I mean, we live in that world of smell as well, but we mostly try to avoid those smells, whereas they really embrace them. And so a lot of my research is about investigating that. Um, so aside from the great pleasures of that, I regularly have dogs and their owners come into my lab and uh, while I'm studying scientifically the four-legged member of that dyad, I, the dog-human relationship I started seeing is kind of the, the elephant in the room, as it were. It's the thing that's happening but is, is not being observed. And of course, I uh, am a person who lives with dogs as well, and so I am a, um, I am a participant in that dog-human relationship. But when I put my science hat on, I started looking at that relationship more closely, um, at how we live with dogs, at how we got to be at this place, where we live with these animals in our homes and um, the dog-human bond. So this book is very much focused on that topic. It's about inquiring after and pursuing, you know, how do we acquire dogs? How do we buy and breed dogs? How do we start to name or train dogs? How do, why do we talk to them? How do we talk to them? Um, how do we see them? And how do they reflect us and how is our behavior toward them reflective on us as individuals and as a species. And what I think is fascinating is that in some ways it's contradictory. So very much we celebrate our dog's individuality, right? Any of you who lives with dogs can tell me about your dog. And in fact, many of you do, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the quirks of your dog's behavior and personality and the things they like and the things they roll in and the, th the way they, their habits. Um, so we're celebrating their individuality, and yet at the same time as, um, as a society, we breed them for sameness. We breed breeds, purebred dogs, which are intended to be predictable in some way, in their behavior, in their appearance, and we appreciate them that way. We name our dogs, and I've done some research on the naming of our dogs, and I write about that in this book, when we give them very significant names, unlike 100 years ago with Rexes and Spots, most of our dogs are now named with human names. There's a Lucy out there, there's a Charlie, there's a George, a Bella. Um, so we're naming them and keeping them close to us. And yet, as a society, we also euthanize every year anonymous millions of dogs. Um, we consider them a part of our family, right? 95% of Americans consider their dog a family member. And yet the law considers our dogs to be property, chattel property, objects whose value is essentially what you paid for them, clearly not measuring the measure of value which we put on our dogs. Um, they're the object that sits by you on the sofa. That's not how I feel about my dog. Um, and they do sit by me on the sofa. Um, we sense their animalism, and I think we celebrate their animalism, the fact that they are animals that we could bring into this human animal society. And yet a lot of the ways we treat them is as little furry humans, right? We dress them up. We even breed many dogs to have a flatter face, which is more like, um, our face, coincidentally. Um, there are ways we talk about their gender, and we consider them gendered, but we also regulate their sex, and most of your dogs are probably desexed. Sex is not a part of their life. So I think in many ways dogs are quite familiar, and yet there are ways we don't see them, right? We talk to them all the time, and I'm fascinated by that, but we're not often listening to them. So this is, I like to dwell in that territory and think about um, not just dogs, but all animals. I actually consider dogs as 
somewhat tail wagging ambassadors to animals, to non-human animals, because our society, I fear, is growing more and more distant to the non-human animal world, and yet there is this one in our homes, right? So I think looking at them with a critical eye at how we live with animals now, at how we live with dogs now, maybe can give us some insight about how we should live with dogs tomorrow. Thanks. Great, wonderful. So as we've heard from Franz's talk, seeing the video of Mama with Jan, hearing a little bit more about dogs, I think everyone in this room understands that animals have the power to change us. So Alexandra, in your book, you start out by talking about when each person makes a decision to breed, buy, or rescue a dog, we enter into a relationship that will change us. It changes the course of our days. Uh, dogs need to be walked, fed, attended to. It changes the course of our lives. They weave their way into our psyches. Uh, and it has changed the course of Homo sapiens. You go on to talk about this paradox that you just introduced about how we treat animals. My cat slept on the pillow with me, but we also have a situation where there are animals in shelters, animals in labs, animals all over the place in agriculture that we treat very differently than on the pillow. So can you tell us a little bit more about why you think we do that? I think that these two strains have evolved in parallel. Right, so 150 years ago, the cats were mostly not on the pillow. The dogs were mostly not on our beds. Um, there, were maybe, there were lap dogs, certainly, and, and um, dogs, some dogs were in the house, but most dogs were outside of the house. So as that's, that changed, the law did not grow up at the same rate. Um, so there were these parallel streams, and now we've gotten to a place where the law and how we treat animals is quite dissonant. But it, you know, maybe if you go back uh, 150 years when the first animal cruelty laws were established, they were about the fact that someone started to see this, started to see these are sentient beings, Henry Berg, for instance, these are sentient beings that we should treat with more care. And the first animal cruelty laws started being introduced. Those were mostly for working animals, not owned animals, certainly not wild animals, or hunted animals, or food animals, um, but for animals who were working for humans. And those laws are, were critically important and a major improvement in animals' lives. They have evolved a little bit over time, but at the same time, they reify this idea that animals are property. In other words, they count on the fact that animals are property. And so we're not to be cruel to animals, not as much for their sake as for the sake that the person who owns them would suffer with the loss of that animal or the loss of the work of that animal. And so even though we don't wanna dismantle our animal cruelty laws, they count on this legal way of considering animals, which now seems anathema to us. And there are people who are doing interesting work to say, what else could we call dogs or other animals apart from property? Some people think, for instance, Stephen Wise, maybe who you know about, who is in, who's interested in um, personhood for chimpanzees, for other animals, for elephants, maybe for all animals, um, but his work has been with chimpanzees, argues that the concept of personhood isn't about being a person, right? A corporation is a person. You, a limited liability corporation, is counted as a person. Persons are just things to the law that can own property. So why don't we consider animals who have interests and understandings and awareness as things which deserve other things? Um, that's his approach. Other people think maybe there could be, you could consider animals like dogs um, living property, and we'd have to consider what they need in the world as opposed to just what we need of them. Mm -hmm. But I think we've come to this place where just two channels of living with animals have separated far enough so that now when you examine it, it's really dissonant. And if you think about how we emotionally handle that, Franz touches on this a little bit in terms of how we regulate empathy and create different categories. So you say, we regulate empathy by opening or closing a door depending on who we identify with and who we feel close to. Can you tell us a little bit about the ways in which we're regulating empathy in that context or others? Yeah, there's actually, is, that's related to the topic is that um, 
we, we open the door for the dog and the cat, but not for the pig and the, uh, and the cow. And, and actually, I, while you were talking, I was thinking that of people who abandon their pets. I, I've never understood how someone can have a dog in the home and the next day is put outside on the highway. I don't, don't know how that works mentally for, for people to do that kind of thing. So yes, we, we have opened the door for our pets, and, and I, do, I do think that our pets are sort of ambassador for the rest of the animal kingdom, because clearly the way we're treating farm animals um, is, is, is totally substandard, is, is totally is cruel in many ways. And, and we're accepting that. And I think there's more and more people, at least especially young people, who are not accepting that anymore. And so um, I personally feel that uh, this whole um, uh, agricultural business with animals is, is on the wrong track, uh, given how we have evolved our views about animals. And part of that comes from maybe from work on chimpanzees, which are our close relatives. And as you know, chimpanzees are not being used anymore in biomedical studies nowadays for that particular reason. Um, but there are so many animals that we mistreat, and uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about that. Even though I've for a long time worked with captive animals, I'm, I'm worried about what we're doing with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know, can I say one other thing about this? The, this feeling of, of giving empathy to other animals, apart from whether animals are showing empathy to each other. Um, one of the things that scientists, and, and Franz's work very much belies this, goes against this, are cautioned against doing is anthropomorphizing, right? Just assuming that animals have the same experiences as we do. And I think it's a challenge, actually, for scientists to try to find out, well, which, well, maybe some anthropomorphisms are right, and some are wrong, and we should investigate. And I, I did one study with, the, with dogs where we looked at the, um, their guilty look, right? Do you recognize? <laughs> you know the look. You know the look. And whether that came up more often when they'd done something to feel guilty for or not, and it doesn't. It comes up more often when someone like you thinks they've done something wrong and goes to punish them, right? And so I wasn't saying dogs don't experience guilt. I'm saying this, look, the behavior they show doesn't show us um, their internal state, maybe the, with that mapping that we thought. That anthropomorphism is, is questionable. But at the same time, um, I, I once gave a talk in Michigan, and the Humane Society came up to me and said, you know, we read about your study, and then when we try to adopt dogs out, we started teaching them the guilty look. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, they would go up and get very angry at the dogs, and the dogs, ah. And they weren't being punished, but they put on that face, that we might call it a submissive face or an appeasement face, just like a, ple a pleading face. And they said, and it actually makes people feel that the dog is more responsive right away to them, and so they're more likely to be adopted. <laughs> so that anthropomorphism allows us to kind of extend them in our circle and bring them in. And then like two months later, they call and they debrief the people, and they're like, you know that guilty like we just taught that to them. <laughs> and at that point, they've bonded, and they're in the family, and there's, so there's no going back. But so I, there's a way in which, like, I, as a scientist, I don't want to just assume animals are, non-human animals are just like us, feel exactly like we do, but I realize that that gesture is important to us having sympathy and empathy for them. But you know, the, 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 the little muscle that makes it possible for the dog to droop its eye a little bit and, and change the size of its eyes, that's a, a dog muscle that the wolf doesn't have. That's right, so the, the uh, eyebrow. Rec yeah, recently a paper came out saying that in our domestication, we have favored dogs who had that yes. puppy expression that they make, you know. That's it's right, the, you know, with the, uh, oh, uh, right? We are, real, we are real suckers for that, apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and anthropomorphism, I always feel that with the primates, at least, it's, it's not an issue. We, anthropomorphism means human-like. Well, the primates are human-like because we are primates. I always felt it's a non-issue, but it was always, it was the weapon of choice of people who wanted to kill any talk about cognition or emotions. They always said, don't be anthropomorphic. So you would say, my dog is jealous, and everyone knows that dogs can be jealous. Uh, you would say that, they would say, oh, don't be anthropomorphic. You should not say these things. Mm -hmm. no. So it's a very big challenge in our field to balance out that, that interest in kind of applying what we know about emotions to animals, and then how we might need to look at it scientifically. And some of the most rewarding conversations I've had at work, no matter where it is, is, is talking about how we perceive the animals and what we think mm. are happening whether we're applying human perspectives and psyche onto the animals and talking about the hilarious thing they did or how they mentally manipulated us, 
So how do you guys think we, the question for both of you, how do we work with that? How have you been working with that as a scientist to ensure that we can kind of have the best of both worlds? Yeah, well, in, in the, the way we collect information, I don't think it is present. If you, if you ask me, uh, do females groom more than males? We have ways of measuring that and, and collecting information. So the information gathering of people who work in the field or in captivity and do experiments uh, is unaffected by that. It's, it's at the interpretation level mm -hmm. that um, uh, this kind of uh, things come in. And, and are you liberal in your interpretations or very narrow, like the, the behaviorists want us to be? And I've always been a bit more liberal. And then you have to fight for the concepts that you introduce. So for example, if I say animals have empathy, people initially didn't want to hear about it uh, because empathy was a human thing. Now, um, I don't think it's an issue anymore. So, and, and this is true for so many cases, so many times this has happened that you were not allowed to say this and 10 years later, everyone is saying it. And so, uh, yeah, we have really evolved in our views of animals. Absolutely. I very much think that some that it's interesting to interrogate the concepts that we're applying even to humans and then that then get applied to non-humans. So, if you say, well, we know that dogs experience jealousy, I say, well, well how, do, how do we know when we're experiencing jealousy? A lot of our emotions are confusing to ourselves, right? In fact, there's a whole industry in humans of getting in touch, learning to get in touch with your emotions. But they're right there, right, to be touched. So obviously, we have troubles with this concept, even when talking about whether it applies to humans. Well, how it applies to ourselves, how to recognize it. And I don't know if I could recognize your jealous feeling if you're just sitting there, even if you experience jealousy. And so I'm challenged by trying to break down the concepts that we want to apply to non-human animals and say, well, what are the behaviors that go along with that? And I, I'm a very big believer in the fact that there are behaviors that give us information about cognition. Um, it's not just behavior with nothing going on in the back. And also, behavior happens so you can observe it um, carefully. And so that's the way I approach it. Um, it does, that means, of course, I never have conclusions. I never have final conclusions. You know, I don't feel like I could ever say mm. as confidently as Fran says, I don't know that I could ever say what a dog is experiencing. No, right? no, Which is different uh, than saying that uh, they have a capacity for emotional experience. No, no, the, I, I make a sharp distinction between feelings and emotions. Yeah. The feelings you will never know. Uh, yeah. Even your feelings, I will, you, as far yeah. as I can tell, you could oh, be zombies. Oh, I can tell you my feelings. You, you could have no feelings whatsoever. <laughs> so so <laughs> feelings, you, I have a feeling. feelings you can talk about, but uh, your feelings I cannot know. <laughs> but your, emotion, your emotions I can know because I can see them, and emotions are expressed in the body. Yeah, and, but and when we talk about emotions, I think we mean feelings, right? Yeah, I think we mean do. it, right? We, are, we conflate those two things. So I think that's what's tricky, is that the way we use language as language users mm -hmm. and the way scientists think of these ideas is different, and mm -hmm. we're, both parties are not sure, because we don't learn language as learning you know, s uh, definitions. Yeah, yeah. We learn language by using it and feeling. Somebody says, like, oh, you did that thing. Alex, young Alex, you broke that thing and now you're feeling guilty. And I'm like, oh, is that what I'm feeling? Right? I didn't know it myself. I didn't learn it in a book. I was told and I kind of had this phenomenal experience. So I think that most of us think of feelings and emotions as the same thing. And so if I say, I know what a dog's emotion is, it's, as, it's the same as saying, I know what they're feeling. And I don't, I don't, I don't know what they're feeling. But you, you do want to make the distinction maybe. Um, so, I so just the, think they're both together. So there are scientists usage. like, let's say, Panksepp, who died yeah. a year ago, yeah. a very famous researcher, or Damasio, and, yeah. and, and me, who say we need to separate feelings and emotions. We can yeah. talk about the emotions. We can measure them in, in all sorts of species. Feelings, um, that's a subjective, private yes. experience. Yes. Yeah. And yes, in our language, we confuse the two. Um, but we should maybe keep them separate. So Franz keeps mm -hmm. calling me the mediator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of the moderator. <laughs> the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm seated in the middle. And, it, and, and this is the best part about scientific discussions. Much like in animal welfare, everything is up for discussion mm. and really helps us expand science and, and kind of take it to another level. But if I can loop back to specific em uh, emotions with guilt, let's just touch base on how many of you guys have dogs at home? All right, what about cats? 
How uh, often uh, have you guilty in your cat? That's my next question. <laughs> I've had always cats in my home, and their guilt level is very low, I would say. <laughs> so perhaps opportunity for a study to look at behaviors in cats that might indicate guilt, which would not at all be how we would perceive it. I think it is because cats are not hierarchical. Because you, you say, basically, the, the guilt of the dog is anticipation of punishment, probably. You know? Some sort of like appeasement behavior. Yeah. And the cats, since they are not hierarchical, and we are not necessarily above them in their mind, <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe how it occurs, no? Yeah. I would say that the guilty look is appeasement behavior, but I don't know about dog's guilt. Uh -uh. What is that dog feeling? What's what are they thinking? That's what I think we want to know and what we assume we know if we say that they feel guilt um, or if we say they don't feel guilt. So I'm just looking at the guilty look. When does that come up? So let's switch to a, a more positive side of the emotional spectrum and think about happiness. Happiness is a really hard word for us in this field. I think sometimes there's a, the science of animal welfare, there's the philosophy of animal rights, and different people use it in different ways. As scientists, I mean, as a scientist, I find it very hard to, to take that topic on. How do you guys see how that fits into your world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say if animals play, and I find always play an indicator of being relaxed. So if we, we did studies, for example, on primates in under crowded conditions or more uh, open conditions where they had more space. And as soon as you start crowding them, the aggression doesn't necessarily go up but the play disappears. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you measure cortisol levels, you know, the stress hormone, the, the cortisol goes up. I always think that if animals don't play, uh, that's a very bad sign. And if animals play, I, uh, I was recently at that bonobo sanctuary, it was an enormous amount of play, by, even by adult females, which in chimpanzees never play, but the bonobos, they play. I, I always find that a good indicator, not, not of happiness, I don't know what that is exactly, but mm. of being relaxed at least. Okay, fair, yeah. enough, fair enough. I mean, I think play is seen as an indicator of welfare across a lot of species. And in fact, it's the reason I got into dogs, right? I wasn't looking to study dogs, but I thought that play might be the place where in a non-human we start seeing the kind of understanding of the other of, of other minds, like thinking when you play as a child and you're doing pretend play and you have to pretend I'm, I'm mom now and you have to take on mom's personality and, um, and you're, somebody else takes the role of, something, of somebody else and you're negotiating with somebody else's perspective. And I see that in play and I was looking for a species um, to study who plays a lot. And of course, you know, the primates that do very much um, but they're not always on demand. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I had a dog, and I was taking her out to play pretty much three times a day. So about six months into doing that, I realized, I should study dogs, right? That's, I should study them. And that's what I did. And it, it was, I must say, my happiness level went way up because mm -hmm. I'm just watching play all the time. All my videos are dog play videos, and that's how I started getting into the question of mind. Um, I think that it is, you know, play is a great marker for dogs. They probably are released of some stressors that a wild animal would have, um, needing to find territory, needing to find a mate, needing provisions. Uh, for many dogs now raising young, that allows them to have this time into which they can spread and play. So that might be a marker of welfare or happiness. Mm -hmm. In the dog-human bond, the interesting element of happiness is the um, oxytocin loop that people talk about, and there's been really nice research showing that when you pet dogs, your oxytocin spikes, and oxytocin is this peptide hormone which is correlated with feelings of pleasure, relaxation, love. It's a hormone that's released between parent and child, for instance, when a parent is holding their child. And that happens when you touch your dog. And also, guess what? It happens for the dog when you look at each other, when you look at each other in the eyes. So there is some, that's a stand-in for, you know, not happy, maybe not happiness, but pleasure, satisfaction, love, affiliation, something like that. Um, it's not a perfect stand-in, but it's definitely, I think, at the root of that bond, right? They, they do now these experiments with the cognitive bias that you probably 
Maybe you're doing them I yourself. I have been doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, the experiment goes, they do it with dogs, with pigs, with all sorts of animals. It goes as follows. You have, for example, a, a high tone and a low tone. And if the, the dog hears the high tone, he will get a reward. And if he hears the low tone, he only gets some maybe a pat on the, on the head or nothing. Um, and very soon, of course, the dog goes always for the high tone if he hears that. And then they give a tone right in the middle. And then they see what the dog does. And, and then the dogs who are so-called optimistic, they go for that medium tone. And the dogs who are pessimistic, they think, well, this is probably nothing. Uh, so that's the test. They've done it with pigs. The interesting thing with the pig study was that if you give pigs a, a very rich environment with a lot of straw and cardboard boxes and company of other pigs, they become optimistic pigs. And if you give them a very bad environment, sort of like a concrete cell with no one, nothing around, um, they become pessimistic pigs. And so th that's the cognitive bias test. It's a very interesting test that has now been done on many different species. Yeah, I, I actually just did a study on that with dogs mm -hmm. where we looked at the before and after levels of optimism of dogs if they participated in scent work games, nose work. I don't know how many of you know nose work, but it's basically just a game where a, a dog goes and searches for smells, right? So I thought that seems really up their alley. And you teach dogs this with their people, but people are just accompanying the dogs. Dogs do the searching. And after six weeks of doing this, uh, actually only, after only two weeks, we saw dogs' optimism went up. They were faster on this, uh, faster to go to that middle container, which the ambiguous container. So they seem to get more optimistic if you let them use their nose. But this is, isn't it beautiful that we use terms like optimism and pessimism for animals, which I'm sure people would have called five years ago anthropomorphic. Yeah. And now we have a so-called measure. Uh, so we, we know exactly what we mean by these two terms, even though it is a bit fishy to call them optimistic <laughs> or pessimistic. Well, you know, you can't put it in a title. You can't put it in a journal paper title. Mm -hmm. But it can be somewhere hidden in the uh, text. Yeah. <laughs> and it will be in the press report. Yeah, for sure. Oh, the, journal, the journalist will immediately <laughs> extract it from you, yeah. yeah. So choose your journals carefully. Always go for public friendly books if you need to really get that message out to folks who might not read those very rigorous articles. <laughs> but each has a place. So we are running low on time because we love to talk about these things and we've barely even touched the list of topics I have listed here. <laughs> so we wanna make sure to open it up to the audience. So we have two microphones and just a few minutes for questions. So if anybody wants to start coming up, we can uh, hopefully get a few in here. And while you guys are coming to the mic, I do just wanna to touch base on different approaches to your books. So it kind of brings the mood to your primary connections to the field. You each take a slightly different approach Alexandra has talked about how she is particularly passionate about how animals experience the world, but of course includes topics in her book about how we interact with them and what that means for us as well. And Franz's book is, is largely focused on animal emotions and what that means in describing ourselves. Mm. So can you tell us what led you into each of those directions, briefly? Mm. Mm. Sure, well I've always been really interested in the experience of dogs, and so I, seeing the people that are coming with the dogs, I got interested in, you know, every owner I meet who comes to the lab is good-hearted and loves their dog and wants to do right by their dog. And I got interested in what, is, what are we as a society handing to people as the tools to interact best with their dog so their dog does have the best experience. Like what, if we, sure, we throw certain special foods and toys and at them and, and games and we have doggy daycares and these things, are these the right things, right? What does science say about this? Where did that stuff come from and how can we make sure it's the right thing going forward given how we feel about dogs in our lives? And they're quicker to get to the queue than I thought, so. <laughs> yeah, um, for, for me, you know, all my, all my work has always been on the emotions even though I was not allowed to talk about the emotions. <laughs> Uh, and so at some point I, I was sort of fed up with that and I, and I decided it was time to just explicitly mention the emotions and, and the feelings and, and discuss them. And also to emphasize how human emotions are important because we tend to downplay, we say don't be so emotional or men will say about women they're so emotional mm -hmm. even though if you look at men during sports games I think there's quite a bit of, <laughs> quite a bit of emotion going on there. 
So, but, but we tend to look down on the emotions. We want to be rational and cerebral, and uh, I don't think we are. I think all our major decisions are always emotional decisions. The, the, the decision who you're going to marry is not um, a rational decision. It's an emotion. The, the important ones are always emotional decisions, and I wanted to emphasize the importance of the emotions. Excellent. So let's go for our first question over here. Thank you. If you get real close to it, it'll work. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier about names for animals. I have cats. I've always had cats for the past about 30 years. And I was taught at that time that when you name a cat, you have to pick a name that the cat likes. Otherwise, the cat will ignore you. <laughs> And did it, I did a cat that, teach you that? Or is that no, it was a human who gave me that information, and I followed it, and it's work that, that I've chosen names for my cats that the cat likes, that I get a glimmer of recognition. I narrow it down after a few days. That becomes the cat's name. And it has to start out with a name I like, but it's also a name that the cat likes. And my cats have always been very interactive with me. They, you know, they, they, you know, they're very affectionate. They're very loving, and I was wondering if you had heard, heard this at all about naming cats or what it has to do with, you know, their recognition of, oh, this is something that, oh, I like this word, and I'll right. associate it with myself. Right, right. I love that you're spending time thinking about naming, and to me, that's the key component about that, right? So in, in, for the last century of animal research, you weren't supposed to name the animals you studied, or at least their names wouldn't be in the papers. Pavlov's dog's names are not in the papers, even though he apparently you know, felt that they were quite dear. Um, and now that's very much changed, and certainly with our animals, we, um, we spend a lot of time naming them. I do not know of any science about what you should name your dog, although I am, or cat, I'm always asked about this, and I usually say, and people will, some people will give you expert advice about it, um, but it's, I think it's wrought of experience, not of, of science per se, and I think um, my advice is always just say, uh, use a name you're happy saying again and again. <laughs> Um, and I do, and I do look askance at people who name their cats cat and dogs dog, because it's individuating the animal, right? It's making that animal an individual like that in your life. So you don't know anything about them, and that's the moment where you start giving them an identity. And I think that's really important. That's an individual identity, not a species identity. But I haven't heard that theory. I'm glad it's worked for you. Yeah, it, <laughs> excellent. It takes. Um, a few days, sometimes I think for one cat it took as long as a week to, to figure out a name that she actually decided, okay, this is the name I want. But Thank you very much for your question. You. I'm sorry, so we are running out of time. They're starting to open up the doors so you guys can go. Thank you guys very much for the people in line. I hope you can have a chance to find them later on when they're signing their books. So next up for our authors, they have their book signing on the lower level at 1.30 in lines 13 and 14. And obviously, you guys are, are very aware that from their numerous best-selling books, Franz and Alexandra really helped bridge that gap between inspiring conversations and rigorous academic publications. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you guys for being here and part of this discussion.